Ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, thank you very much, Anne, and thank you very much for the great things you do. Um, I've been asked this very important question, right? How to imagine the liberal democracy of the future? My first reaction was, is there any other type of democracy? And uh, I think probably the best that we can do in this session is try to look into the past and probably look into the past in a different way. Probably looking at what's happening to our economy, what's happening to productivity. In the early civilizations of the time, land was power. So we fought wars, sometimes for decades, just to control land. And whoever could amass the most land was the most powerful. Land was a factor of productivity the first factor of productivity. Then it became the time of capital, and capital and the ability of invest that capital. And that was our second factor of productivity for economists. And finally, we had the Industrial Revolution, and labor came into play. Labor was our third factor of productivity. But then today, what's happening? Technology became the focus of power. Who controls the machines controls the future. Who controls the data? But where is the data in productivity? I don't see it in the calculations of productivity. Data is in the big market caps of the big companies of the day like Apple and Google and Facebook, but then you don't see that data in the productivity numbers. And that, for me, is one of the things, or the point, that we have to look going forward. Because if you don't change the way that you calculate your productivity, then you will keep on having these attacks on the liberal democracy. Yuval Harari said once that the reason using our own data against us was such a successful approach by fascists, it was because it played in our weaknesses and our fears. And I think probably looking into the future, looking how you take into account the changes, we probably have to uh, look it at in a personal way to look what are our fears and weaknesses, and also in an innovation kind of way. And so if you look at the personal side, what you see is that probably what happened to democracy is that technology changed the world for something that we were not expecting. We thought we would become more rational because of technology, and we became more emotional. And so if we became emotional, that's why, that's why we fear the future, because the future was not rational, was not as we expected. And the second is about innovation. We need to design our institutions in a new way to make sure that our data is protected, but that our institutions are adapted to a data and a technology of these times that is not the physical world. So how do we adapt institutions like this one that is physical and analog to times of digital and innovation? So above all, we need to act. We have to uh, take this lesson that our institutions have to change. But who better? than Minister Radek Sikorsky to be joining me here today. I've been following him for a long time before he knew I existed. Um, I've been reading his speeches for a long time to inspire my own speeches because I think that he's probably one of the best communicators that I've uh, ever seen. And so I invited him at uh, last year to come to Portugal and it was really a fantastic moment because Radek Sikorsky really represents a very different type of politician, a straight talker, someone that tells as it is. If you have never seen one of his interviews, 
go on YouTube and look for hard talk. And there's a hard talk in between uh, Radek Sikorsky that is just amazing. Tells you everything about the discussions about the Brexit, about why things are where they are. And um, so I'm so happy to have you here, uh, Radek. Really uh, very, very good. I was just, before I came, I always do these searches about what he's doing. And I came to a, a little, uh, also a little video of him with Henry Kissinger. And I said to myself, my God, I'm going to be Radek like he was with Kissinger in 2012. So that is uh, absolutely delightful and absolutely with Anne. So thank you so much for joining us here in the commission. Um, and uh, so I now go and sit down and then you can have a talk. And Radek, you come up. Thank you. Well, thank you, thank you, Commissioner, for this uh, generous uh, introduction. My mother would be pleased. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and uh, let me tell you how delighted I am to be here. And I want to, to start my remarks by thanking all the friends of Poland and all the friends of democracy who have stuck by us in these difficult times in Poland who have not been intimidated by the nationalist propaganda, sometimes by vicious personal attacks, and who have stuck up for the rule of law, for the respect for our own constitution and for our European treaties, and who are now seeing the victory of common sense in Poland and uh, the withdrawal of the government from its assault on uh, independent judiciary. Well done, European Commission. Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner, you have said that uh, democracy uh, is not just voting, and I, I couldn't agree more. Democracy is an ecosystem in which you respect uh, rights of minorities, you, you also respect institutions, and we also know that institutions are only as, as good as the um, sense of propriety and the courage, quite frankly, uh, of the people who hold those posts. And um, we have a problem uh, with democracy. We have a problem with liberal values in the modern world. One problem is that in the post-communist world, uh, in that part of Europe, I will make self-criticism. We thought that after decades of communism, the benefits of democracy and the benefits of European integration were so blindingly obvious that we did not need to fight for them and we did not need to educate our young people for them. And this, this, this was an oversight. We need, to, we need to correct that. But the second difficulty is structural. Already George Orwell in his um, uh, review of um, uh, Chancellor Hitler's Mein Kampf uh, remarked that there is a fundamental difference between liberal and non-liberal values. Liberal values are tepid. Liberal values are about prosperity, about people making decisions for themselves. Um, they work in practice, but they do not produce communal um, uh, emotions. They do not make your heart beat. They do not give you a, a, an adrenaline boost which is what you get from marching around and, and um, uh, displaying torches and experiencing atavistic um, uh, mass emotions. Uh, and, and, and so there's a, there's a real difficulty there. Secondly, we have new ways of communicating. Every communication revolution has produced a, um, a, a political revolution the printing press, the reformation, the radio, communism and, and fascism. And this revolution is, of course, faster and more profound. It has linked marginal, frustrated uh, radicals into networks. And I think fundamentally, it has stripped mainstream media from authority. Truth used to be what the New York Times or the Financial Times or the big networks arrived at after an editorial process. And now we have the soup of news, innuendo, 
uh, accusations, libel, you call it. And this is not for free. Facts matter. Let me give you a, an example. In, in Poland, uh, just in the last few weeks, we had a, um, uh, a petition by a group of citizen according to, citizens according to our constitution who brought in a draft law to, um, remove, from, to remove from the statute book the uh, obligation to uh, immunize children. There's uh, some kind, of, one of those irrational conspiracy theories is that uh, uh, these, these uh, the Im immune vaccines give you uh, whatever. It's completely unscientific, but in every society, some group of people will buy this stuff. And I was not surprised that uh, the famous St. Petersburg troll factory actually gave a boost to this campaign, because anything that harms the West is good. Uh, and, um, uh, and the ruling party in Poland actually passed uh, the proposed uh, draft law into the committee stage. And yeah, because you, 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 know, you, you, you can get 100,000 votes that way. And then what happened? We got uh, the beginnings of an epidemics of, uh, I'm not sure what the English language of this, uh, uh, what is Odrad? Is there a Polish speaker here? Anyway, one of those uh, diseases. And then they quickly um, uh, uh, struck down this, this initiative. Facts matter because they lead to a change of reality. Facts also matter for democracy, because you cannot introduce an autocracy without lying. Uh, one of the first things they do is to capture media and to lie, to uh, hoodwink the uh, electorate. Which is why we need uh, to fix the um, ways that we process political information. And you said, Commissioner, that we have these tech giants uh, who are incidentally foreign-owned, but I'll come to that, uh, which is, and it is through, through them that the great majority of our citizens now get political information, and it is sometimes skewed, skewed by the nature of the process, but by also by enemies of democracy. And we, we know it's been done in Brexit, it's been done in the United States, it's been done in Poland, Italy, you name it. And I put to you that the situation in which you can um, do in cyber what you would be banned by law from doing in the real world is extraordinary and unacceptable. Uh, as humanity, we have found out historically that every wonderful invention, take the motor car, eventually has a downside. And eventually you have to regulate it. And the highway code um, was created about 25 years after the invention of the motor car, when people started dying. And I think we are at this uh, stage with, um, with the, uh, cyber, because I'll, I'll tell you as a practicing politician, uh, and at least until recently, that it is absurd that if um, in this room I libeled someone, I would be um, liable. How many people are there? 200? Well, there are cameras as well, but let, let's, let's imagine that it's just that 200, okay? You're liable. If you write something in a university leaflet, you're liable. Uh, and if you write it on the web page of a tabloid where 40 million people can read you, you're immune. At least in Poland, we've had a, a judgments of the court which say, oh no, that's just holding data. That's not publishing. Uh, the, the owner of that site is, is immune from prosecution or from civil uh, responsibility. It is absurd. It's completely absurd. We cannot tolerate this. We need, to, and I think we have two parts. Either, and that would be a sort of British approach, either you decide that 
without inventing new laws, that whatever is illegal in the real world is also illegal in, cyber, in the cyber world because the technical means of delivering certain uh, uh, messages are irrelevant, or you invent new laws. And that would be probably more continental way of doing it. And I'll finish with this, that, that I'm, I hope that in that, that the European Union is actually the great hope of mankind because we are not, the European Parliament and the European Commission is not owned by these tech giants. Uh, you know, they now lobby the US Congress. The China is not going to do it for their own reasons. In fact, my, my worst nightmare is that China is developing an alternative model in which social media are a substitute for democracy. You detect what people want, you do it, and then what do you need democracy for? All right? but, but the European Union is my great hope that we will be pioneers in, in, um, um, in making the cyber world safe for democracy. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Radek. That was absolutely uh, fascinating. I mean, we, this is a visioning uh, uh, session. So, I mean, it seems to me what, what I think you're both suggesting is that somehow we need to, we need to bring democracy into the 21st century digital age. I mean, what is uh, illegal off the illegal uh, uh, online, etc. But I mean, if you had to look 10, 15 years ahead and you, you express a, a hope that Europe will get there, but what concretely, I mean, what would it look like? How would it be different from the democracy that we've known to date? Well, first of all, we have to protect, protect our ecosystem from predators. Uh, and we now know that um, um, uh, significant amounts of money were spent on promoting Brexit significant amounts of money are uh, spent uh, and used very effectively to promote radicalism. Um, and remember, and this is really dangerous, not because this can affect 30% of the vote. Whether or not authoritarians come to power often, usually, uh, is decided by two to 3% of the vote. Mm. And this can be affected by these um, by these operations in, in, in the cyber world, which give enemies of Europe and enemies of democracy an undue uh, influence. So first of all, you know, protect the process, just as we would in the offline world. Um, secondly, I, there is a, 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 not just a perception, a reality that our institutions are too slow for, for the digital world. Uh, and that our party systems, for example, are, uh, are too um, old-fashioned, and you can see it in numbers. You know, the British Tory party, I think, used to have three million people. It now has, I think, 100,000 people. The largest political party in Poland has 170,000 people. My party, which is the largest opposition party, has probably 30,000 members. Uh, so, you know, the, the faith in the traditional parties is less. I think people would like their politics to be like their consumer experience. Mm. You know, picking parties or initiatives for a purpose and discarding them when they've, when they've um, uh, fulfilled that purpose. And perhaps this could be done. Perhaps the future of politics is uh, purpose-created um, uh, coalitions mm. to solve particular issues. Uh, I don't know how it works in other EU countries, but in Poland, one of the most successful um, uh, reforms that we've had is in the uh, self-government. And we have uh, directly elected mayors, we have strong uh, regions, uh, and, um, and very successful uh, municipalities. And municipalities now have these local referenda uh, and citizens' budgets. It's not like in California where you can vote for higher spending and lower taxes at the same time and bankrupt the place. <laughs> um, no, the, 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 the municipal council will apportion a, a, a part of the budget that they feel that the city can afford 
and the people are asked, do you want this money to be spent on a road or on a theater or, or, or on a swimming pool? And that really involves people. And that, I think, is a way of bringing uh, democracy closer to the citizens. Mm. And I think we should be doing more of that sort of thing. It's very interesting. I mean, I think what, what you're describing is sort of a... Um, a system where you say we need to be faster, we need to uh, sort of uh, get closer to the citizen, but that's actually something that the populists uh, do very well. I know of one uh, very successful populist in Europe who shall be unnamed. Uh, it is a man, however, you may find very difficult to believe, um, who, um, who um, had a, um, an app developed for him. So he throws out um, sort of uh, very divisive messages and the app then um, uh, analyzes what sticks. Right? What, what is popular out there? And then this is what he will go with. Um, so, I mean, I, I can see the, the flip side of this, but what underpins all of it, and I was glad, I think both of you brought this up, is the issue of emotion, saying that maybe, you know, there isn't enough emotion. But that is, of course, uh, a, a major challenge. I actually came across the issue of emotion in the work that we did on radicalization because we were trying to figure out, we had experts, we talked to experts about why young men of Muslim faith become radicalized. And uh, one of the things is around emotion, that what we have to offer, which is democracy, liberal values, equality, doesn't speak to them. It doesn't speak to their emotion. So they're looking for other ways to entice their emotion. I mean, any any thoughts on that? I mean, Carlos, maybe is this something maybe that has been studied or should be studied more? Uh, I think that it, it's interesting because most of us, like engineers like me, you really thought that technology was about uh, getting us more rational. But it's fine now when you go back to the literature and you go to guys like McLuhan that in the 60s, well before the whole thing and the internet, he used to say that the literate man is rational, but the electronic man, he called it, would be more emotional and tactile. And it's, it's true. I mean, in, in the 60s, so there was these visionaries that already saw that because I think that the fact that you, the medium is the image, it's about those emotions. And there's nothing you can do about it because it will be emotional. But then it becomes that everything that you are or that is rational, you can digitize, but you cannot digitize your own emotions. Uh, and so what's the effect of that in democracy? And I, I so agree what Radek was saying about um, what's happening in the cyber world, right? And then Radek, he, he was uh, very humble, not to talk about his personal experience, where he has been attacked in, in different ways in the cyber world, um, in imaginable that you cannot even imagine. So I think that how do you tackle this emotional world? How, what are the tools that you have? And then with those tools, you can rebuild democracy. I think that for me, the, important today, the importance of today of rebuilding democracy is about the institutions. And I just wanted to stress that point uh, to all of you, is that if you don't build institutions in a new way, we all gonna just destroy the whole thing. You know, we all talk about digitizing our institutions. Look at this place where we are in the commission and all the other administrations. I mean, I still receive my letters that supposedly come in a digital format, but they come through 20 people <laughs> that each one has to sign the letter. And my question is, I'm, am I really digitizing the institution? No, because I'm using exactly the same process that on the physical world was the one. Because before I would have to go and get the letter from the mailman to the first person to the 20th person, then everybody has to sign off. So even when we think that we are digitizing the institution, we're not. We are just copying and pasting the physical institution into a, a digital world. And that's where we get lost, is that democracy is really uh, not about the physical world today. Um, and uh, the example also of uh, Radek on the motor cars, um, it's exactly that, we don't know. The, the thing is that we don't know. And just a very final point to the, uh, the co-design of uh, policies. Um, I think that probably the truth 
is not to be top-down, because we know that top-down today doesn't work, but the pure bottom-up doesn't work either. So where, what is the question that you ask, and when I think that now there's a lot of good examples of municipalities that are doing it, but it's about how do you co-design with the people. And that is also something very difficult. It's easier to speak in conferences mm. and try to rationalize the whole thing, but it's very difficult to do um, in, in particular. Absolutely. Any thoughts? Yes. Uh, look, we will not get away from the emotional uh, side uh, and its role in politics because Homo sapi sapiens is only half rational. Yeah, emotions are shortcuts and they will always be there. Um, but, uh, but that's where leadership comes in. You know, there are leaders who play on people's positive emotions and try to mobilize people for higher ends, and then the easier way is to play on people's fears, because fear is a more powerful, uh, as Machiavelli already taught, a more, more reliable <laughs> uh, emotion um, uh, than gratitude or, or, or positive emotions. So leadership is important. President Macron, who of course has difficulties now, but proved that you can win. Guy Verhofstadt does it very well, uh, also in social media. There are others. But, but, um, but you also need to engage with the populists because nothing is set in stone, nothing is permanent in politics. Let me give you an example. Uh, and I know this, 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 maybe the commission is, um, is innocent in this, but nevertheless, the, resu the, the result is unfortunate. I am convinced that if for the last 30 years, the commission office in London had been active, engaged in British media, which are uniquely uh, fun and confrontational and... Uh, and, uh, and, and if you'd employed a, um, a, a, tabloid, a British tabloid journalist to correct all the myths about the EU that, that were uh, peddled by irresponsible politicians and journalists, um, perhaps Brexit could have been prevented. Because this, it really was a vote out of ignorance. People had no, for, no idea how an EU directive is made and what the difference between the single market and the customs union is. Uh, the, the cabinet now knows, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but the public is still learning. Um, and so, um, so first of all, you engage with, with the populists. But also you have to ask yourself why they are popular. Because populists always latch on to an issue that the establishment has neglected. And I can tell you in my country, um, even though we have no migrants, um, migration did, did help to swing the, the, the last general election towards the populists. Uh, perhaps may even have given them victory. And when they say um, it's political correctness uh, and, and, and whoever mentions migration is regarded as a, as a racist, I'm afraid they have a point. Mm. Uh, the European establishment delegalize a sensible uh, discussion of the rates, uh, acceptable rate of migration, uh, conditionality of migration, how to make people into good citizens, and so on. So the, the issue was, was festering on the margins and then suddenly made it into, into the center. Uh, and we're living with the consequences. Um, we've had these populist movements before, and not just in Europe. In the United States, at the end of the 19th century, there was a very powerful um, movement for uh, silver-based currency rather than gold-based currency. And this was really, in today's terms, about looser monetary policy. Um, and traditionally, the way you do it, and of course, the populists propose simple solutions to complex problems, uh, uh, just as they do to migration. And so you need to defang the issue by solving that part of it which can be solved. And you have to identify what they are. 
If I, if I look a little bit of how the world is different now, the political world, I note one, we're sort of in a permanent campaigning season, sort of, and that goes back to the issue of the emotions. Huh? I mean, it, it makes it very difficult. Secondly, as you say, that there are sort of burning issues where there is a certain speechlessness among the elite, uh, and then the populace step in, and they finally speak about something that people is really, uh, they're very happy about and uh, therefore uh, uh, support. But in a non-technocratic language. Exactly, in a very non, and, and, and yes, and, and, and uh, in a language that leads to emotional arousal. So that finally someone hears me and, and I think that's dangerous. But the third point, and, and I'm asking for your comment on this, is we're seeing governments, I mean, change of governments have never to the extent that I think we're seeing now led to sort of a questioning of the institutions or an undermining of the very institutions which help these populists to get elected. Do you understand what I'm saying? Whether it's the legal system, whether it is certain checks and balances. So they use democracy to get elected, but then to undermine the democratic institutions that made it possible. How? How do we get at this? I mean, how do we make our institutions and our processes more resilient to these kind of threats? Well, as I said in my introduction, our institutions are only as strong as the people who man them. And, you know, these are testing times so. for Democrats. And uh, uh, look, in the United States, the, the president has just been rebuked by the Chief Justice. It's a wonderful example of a a powerful democratic institution doing its job. Uh, in Europe, it's harder because, um, because the division of powers is usually less strict than, than in the United States. Uh, but, but it's a real problem when people don't fulfill their roles, but their actual loyalty is to some party leader rather than to their oath of office, right? Well, we need to hold people to their oaths of office. And, and thanks to the peer review that we have in Europe, um, the European Parliament, uh, the Council of Europe and the Commission also have their role. And I again thank you for, for exercising it. Mm -hmm. Just add a comment that uh, I think that in, in the last 20 years, somehow politicians, because of the scrutiny, uh, and rightly so, a lot of the politicians in a lot of countries decided, look, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to basically give more power to the technocracy. And so I'm not going to be blamed because if I say that there's a decision and I don't take that decision, it's going to be just on the technocratic level, I'm going to be fine. And I think what people today feel on the streets is that they feel that the politicians have no more power. They don't have power to change the decisions. And so who are the only ones that come with a different proposal? Are the populists, because they say, you know what, I don't care about the institutions. I'm going to get there, I'm going to fire everybody, I'm going to fire the judges, I'm going to fire these, and I'm going to change, you're going to have a better life. And I think that was a little bit of the problem of the mainstream politicians. They were afraid to take responsibility in their actions. And I see it in every country. And before I thought it was just about my country. And I know I feel it, it's all over Europe. And so I think there's also, we come to a, a period where we need to be more political in general. And we have to take responsibility. If I do a mistake, people just vote me out. But I have to have and I need to have the power to take some decisions and this is not against the technocracy because the institutions are essential but it's about the fact that sometimes you have to change quicker and I think that the public servants would appreciate that because people need guidance if yeah. you are a very good public servant you want the guidance you don't want to be the one the one designing the political strategy if not, you'd go into politics. And I think that is something that uh, has raised a lot of the parts. There's loads of reasons, but that's this one is one that in my political life I felt so much. Mm -hmm. um, the second point I want just to compliment on uh, Radek's comment when he said about why didn't um, the EU have someone in London fighting more, etc. And I think that the whole project of the European Union when it was built, was built about creating these institutions like ours that would not be on the front of the stage. 
So even the type of communication that people were trained to have, we're about to put the countries on the front of the stage, you would be on the back of the stage. And when you are in the back of the stage, your style of communication is very different. Mm. Uh, and so um, I would remember that going to uh, the UK uh, and I would feel that our representation was almost hidden, right? There was uh, not even like a big flag and I understand why, but so we were kind of hiding uh, and with uh, lots of good people, great people that were there trying to fight, but we didn't have the, the tools. So probably uh, right, we have to be more assertive uh, now mm. uh, on that. We're gonna. I, I'm, I, we're gonna have to wrap up in a moment. But just two points, yeah. because this is this is the core of the issue, I think, because th it's not about technocrats. It's about you. It's the, the 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 political method in all member states is to pocket all achievements of the EU as your achievements and and to blame everything that goes wrong wrong on Brussels. And we've come to the end of that method. If, as Europe, we continue with that method, we will deprive the EU of its legitimacy. Because the Commission behaves like a civil service, withdrawn, right? Politicians blame everything on Brussels. Euro even European parliamentarians feel that they represent their constituencies. So who speaks for Europe? Who yeah. defends it? And in that context, I'm disappointed that we have not created the out of the British um, uh, seats, a, a group of pan-European members of parliament that would speak for Europe. And secondly, I just hope that we will uh, not um, be, have this suicidal gene uh, manifested in, in allowing people like, uh, like Nigel, Nigel Farage to come here, draw European money, and use that European money to destroy Europe. I mean, are we nuts? <laughs> you know, we should do here what we do in our national parliaments. Okay, you've been elected, you can take up your seats, but if you want the privileges of, mem of, um, of being an MEP, why don't you swear an oath of allegiance to the institution that you'll be working for? You know, that you will not be an enemy of the institution that, that you're working at. That's a very good point. Uh, before we wrap up, uh, 20 seconds or less, uh, you are both politicians. Uh, most of us here are sort of policy planner types, analysts. Uh, what's your message to us? What do we need to do better? Because we're at least partly to blame for the situation as well. 20 seconds or less. <laughs> that, this <laughs> reminds me, during the... Uh, when, when the Polish Pope died and um, uh, Larry King was interviewing a cardinal, he said, so, do you think he is with God? You have 30 seconds. <laughs> 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 Sorry, I can't do it in 20 seconds. <laughs> All right, Carlos? <laughs> Very good. I think that... Uh, you, uh, you have to be more assertive to in your day-to-day -day jobs. Don't be afraid of uh, talking. Don't be afraid of uh, saying what you think as policy makers, as public servants. It's not just about the politicians. So the politicians have to give you the guidance of where we're going. But then when I go to conferences and I see you on stage, don't be afraid to speak up. And sometimes you'll say things that probably don't make a lot of sense. We do the same, so no problem. <laughs> and uh, sometimes you'd say things that your boss will come and say, oh, did you say these? I mean, like the line to take was not really that. Take that risk. No, go I mean, at the end of the day, like, nobody will gonna remember that. But you will defend Europe. And people will see in you the passion and uh, the fact that you really believe in what you're doing. So uh, this is, I mean, is, is uh, as Brazilian right. people say, it's for free, so it's probably not good advice. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's I couldn't agree more. Okay. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm round of applause. Carlos Moedas, Radoslav Sikorski. Thank you.